Hey guys, welcome back. So today, I'm working on this 5500 watt PowerMate generator. Uh, this one I don't know much about. Actually, Jason found it. He's a local guy who buys and sells equipment. And while he was buying something else, he came across this one. You know, the guy only wanted $20 for it. And believe it or not, Jason was not interested. This is an older machine and hard to sell. But he did send me a couple pictures and asked me if I'd be interested in it to make a video or worst case for parts. So the answer was yes to both. Now, I know nothing about this machine. For all I know, it is a good running machine and doesn't need anything. But from what I can see on the surface, I do see some issues at a minimum that need to be dealt with. You know, over here, we have a key for the electric start and it is damaged and bent. Actually, the whole control panel is bent and we have some cracks right there and a loose plug. So at some point, this got a bit damaged. That should be fixed or at least improved on. Uh, the other thing I noticed is that the power head is usually where the model sticker is and there is none. So I don't know exactly what model this machine is. You know, over here, we kind of have a hodgepodge of parts. And what I mean is we have kind of an old school Briggs flathead with a flow jet carburetor with a more modern exhaust, a modern air box, and a modern tank and frame. So, you know, if I had to guess, I would say this is a 90s model machine kind of in between the older flathead engines and the more modern generators that we see today. But I can't ID the engine either because the blower housing was replaced and that's where the model number is. Now, it looks like someone did sand this and scratched in the model info, but I can't make out most of the numbers. So, yeah, if we need parts, it might be a bit of a challenge. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. These are all minor things. You know, the tank, I guess, is another minor thing, but I can see we do have issues here. We have either a scratch or a crack right there, and it looks like someone drilled into the tank right there. Thankfully, not all the way through. And inside the tank, it is mostly empty, uh, but there is a little bit of old fuel down there. So the tank also needs to be cleaned. But I'm not gonna worry about any of that for now until I hear the engine run and see that the generator makes power. So let me get you set up a little bit better and get going on this. Well, the first problem's been solved. We do have the generator model number. So from that, I can at least look up a parts diagram for everything except the engine. And if I'm really lucky, it'll list the engine model that came on this machine. You know, also I was wrong. This is only a 5,000 watt model. All right, let's start just by pulling this air box cover off. I wanna make sure there's no nest in there and see if we have an air filter. Yeah, got a nice air filter here. Much nicer than you'd see on anything made today. Not dirty, a little bit old looking, but I think it'll be okay. And the choke is on, that is not stuck. So that is a good sign. So let's see what we have for oil in here. This is kind of an odd setup too. Usually there's not an extension like this. The cap goes down here you fill it until the oil starts to spill over. So with an extension like this, hopefully they added a dipstick. Otherwise it's gonna be hard to tell how much to put in. And yeah, we do have oil. It's nice and clean and we have a dipstick. So let's just double check the level. Yeah, plenty of oil and clean. Might be a touch over full, but I think we'll be fine for testing. Actually, before moving on here, let's just cut this fuel line. It is very petrified. We know we have to take a closer look at the tanks. So I wanna get that out of the way. I guess before I cut it, let's check the fuel valve. And 
unfortunately the fuel valve was left on. So that is not a good sign, but let's just cut the line right here and get the tank out of the way for now. I guess the good news is there was no fuel in the line. So there's a chance, a slim chance, that this was stored properly. So I'm going to try feeding it a little bit of fuel and see if the carburetor accepts it. Yeah, carbs definitely accepting fuel. And it looks like the needle shut off. So this might start. So let me secure this maybe out of the way of the exhaust. We'll pull the engine over, see what we get. So let's put this in the run position. I did plug in a light and it is turned on. So in the event the engine starts, we can see if it makes power. Let's just double check the throttle. That plate is not stuck. We'll give it a bit of choke. And that fuel line is secured away from the exhaust. So let's pull the engine a few times and see what we get. That is crazy. It started the first pull. And not only that, but the engine sounded good. The carburetor was running the engine and we were making power. So everything critical here is working. Now that said, the carburetor wasn't completely happy. I did have to apply the choke several times to keep the engine running. So most likely this carb does need to be cleaned. Uh, it does have adjustable needles though. So potentially we could tune it to run better. But given the age of this machine, you know, I think the carb should be gone through anyway, and then we can fine tune it after. So before I pull the carb off, I'm actually going to refuel. I want to run it one more time and just see if I can get that choke all the way off. Yeah, definitely a carb issue, I would say. You know, I ended up backing the main jet out one full turn. That should allow more fuel in. And even after that adjustment, I saw no difference. You know, as soon as I turned the choke off, the engine stalled out. So the carb, it needs to be cleaned up. We'll do that in a second. But since it's hot, you know, let's change the oil. I think it's earned it. Let's try to do this without making a huge mess. And unfortunately, the furniture dolly is right underneath here. So I'm going to use this form of funnel to 
kind of direct the oil backwards into that pan. nice feature this engine has too is the elusive oil sensor right there. You know, a lot of the Briggs made kind of in the mid 2000s did not have that oil sensor. And most newer engines have it actually internal to the engine, meaning you can't service it when it fails without taking the whole engine apart. You know, in this case, it's just two bolts. The sensor comes out and you could put a new one right in. Yeah, it's a little bit hard to tell. The oil is so clean, but it looks like we are full. Uh, this engine took about 48 ounces of oil. So we'll start by getting the air box off. I think it's just these two screws that hold the whole thing on. And we also have a breather right here coming from the engine, so we'll have to remove that. before the airbox will come off. One more bolt right there, actually. There's another bolt down here. To get the carb off, it's pretty straightforward. There's just one bolt down here. We got two screws right there holding it to the intake manifold. Of course, the fuel line. And then finally, we can get the governor linkage off right there. I'm going to start by just cutting off the rest of this old fuel line. You know, when they're petrified like this, they're no longer flexible and they're, they actually hold on to the barb extremely well to the point where trying to get it off, you know, it's just more trouble than it's worth. So we'll just cut that off and maybe score this with a utility knife. It looks like this is metal, so it should be pretty safe to do. All right, so let's get this needle out for the main jet. We can drain the carb through that. Bit of debris came out. So, you know, this carb, I'm expecting it to not be too bad since it kind of runs the engine. But you can tell by the debris, you know, there is some junk in there for sure. So let's actually see where the needle was set. Now, right now, it's a turn further out than it was because I did make an adjustment. So I'm going to turn it in one full turn. 
and we actually need to put it back to see where it's going to bottom out against that main jet. So that's one, one and a half. Yeah, it was two turns out. So when we put it back together, we'll set it there. That seems like a reasonable starting point. And of course, we'll fine tune it once the engine's running. Yeah, it's not too bad, actually. So to split the carb, there's just these four bolts on the top and the top lifts off. Now, before we can do that, we have to get the main jet out. It's also the emulsion tube and it goes up the length of the carburetor diagonally. And with that installed, you can't separate the two halves. So hopefully this is not stuck in there. Here it goes. Yeah, not too bad. Uh, there is some debris. You know, maybe there are a few clogged holes. So that needs to be cleaned for sure. Let's see if these bolts will come out. Yep. And let's take this needle out too. This is the pilot needle and actually I wasn't able to adjust it because the air box is right up against it. So not the best location for it. So that was just over one and a quarter. And it is most likely this circuit that's clogged, not the main jet. Because even though the engine was running at full speed, it had no load on it. And when it has no load, the throttle plate's mostly closed and fuel or very little fuel is coming through the emulsion tube. Most of it's coming through this circuit, which you can just see right there. There's actually a hole in front of the throttle plate. And that's what supplies a majority of the fuel uh, when the engine's not under load. So let's see if we can get this off without breaking the gasket. There is a gasket going across the whole top here in between the halves. And I don't have another, so. Hopefully this one comes off clean. It's really glued on there. I hope there's not RTV holding that closed because it feels a little sticky. And if it's glued shut, then yeah, might have to rip it. <laughs> yeah, it's probably glued shut or maybe it's just a ton of varnish. Yeah, it is not budging. And I'm not really seeing any good pry points. Yeah, maybe if I put one of these back in and lightly tap down on it, it'll maybe force the two halves apart. Not sure. Yep. I heard the noise change, so it is coming apart. Let me just do that on each of the corners. Usually I like shocking it sideways because that 
minimizes the chance of the gasket ripping. Doing it like this, it's probably going to rip it, especially since it's glued. But I just want it open so we can clean it. We'll worry about getting a new one a bit later. Yeah, not bad actually. Bowl looks very clean, you know, just a hint of varnish, but I don't see any anything to be concerned about there. You know, of course we got a brass float. So let's get that out of there. And the needle, which seems to be in pretty good shape. Now, the gasket surprisingly isn't totally trashed, you know, although we did take some off here. So, yeah, we might need a new gasket. You know, was this one glued? Not sure, but every corner kind of stayed behind. So, if we put it back exactly the way it came off, it may not leak. But worst case, we can order another one. For now, let's just get the engine running well, and we can always revisit this. Yeah, main jet. It's not clogged. And let's check the pilot circuit. If we shine a light up through here, we should be able to see the light right there. And I think I do. Yeah, I can see the light through there. So neither jet was clogged. So I'm a little surprised actually that this didn't run better. Needle actually doesn't look all that great. I'm surprised it was working. And yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was just that junk. I see a little bit of water down there. So that may have been enough to make it run like we were seeing. Anyway, let's just run this through the ultrasonic. We'll reassemble it and try it again. So a good way to make sure all the stuff is clear is just to use a bit of carb spray, being sure not to get any on any neoprene or rubber because that will distort it in some cases. So just starting with the pilot jet, you know, if I spray through that, we should see it coming out on the side of the carb here in the throat. So we'll give that a little squirt. And let's open that so you can see it a little better. So that is working fine. So that's how the fuel gets from kind of the needle area into the throat of the carb. Now, as far as how the fuel even gets to the pilot circuit, you know, I think that's where this comes into play. It is the main jet. It is the emulsion too, but it gets installed diagonally. And you can see there's a hole on the side right there. So when this is installed, you know, in the bottom half of this carburetor, the end of this tube ends up where it does in the passage bringing fuel up to the pilot circuit. So if the main jet's clogged, nothing is getting fuel. And of course, when the plate is closed, it's only the pilot circuit really that's pulling any fuel. The more this opens, the more fuel is drawn actually through the emulsion tube and exits through these little holes. 
Anyway, the top part, it is clear. You know, this I've tested, it is clear as well. So no issues there. You know, as far as the bottom half, there's not a whole lot. You know, I know that is clear because I can see right through it. That's where the pilot jet goes. Um, actually, that is the drain. So the bowl fills up with fuel. It goes down there, which is where the main jet is, and then gets picked up and comes through this tube right here. And this one, I think it's just an air passage. It goes down also to where the main jet is and really goes nowhere. It just goes up to the top right there and there's no passage. So I think it's just to draw air through. And there's actually another air passage right here. If I spray in here, it should exit right there. Should, yeah. So that is not clogged and there's a corresponding passage on the bottom of this cover right there. And that actually just goes right here, kind of underneath the gasket. You'll see when I spray in there. So yeah, nothing's clogged. So this should run just fine. I'm willing to bet it was that. Little bit of junk causing it to run badly. It smells bad too. So, you know, we're run running through the ultrasonic anyway just to make it perfect. And we'll try it out. We're getting there. It's going to need, I'd say, another 10 minutes or so. So while that carburetor is cooking away, I'm going to take a quick look at this starter recoil. I don't know if you noticed, but when the engine started and stalled, it was making a strange chirping sound. And the way this works is that there's actually a clutch on the crankshaft and normally when the engine's running, the crankshaft is spinning inside that clutch. The clutch should be still and there's actually a little port to oil it to help it stay still. So I think that noise might have been just a dry clutch. So we'll add a bit of oil and while I'm in there. I think I'm gonna replace this rope as well. It's not in terrible shape, but I have stuff better. So might as well do it while we're there. You got a different size there. And that's what I'm talking about right there. So this piece has some ball bearings in it. When you turn it clockwise, it locks and that's how the engine rotates. But once the engine starts spinning, this piece essentially stays still while the engine is rotating. So this is the port here. You want to use some thin oil and there's a felt pad in there. So we might need to do this a couple times. But we'll give this a try, see if that takes care of the noise.
All right, so let's get this rope out of here. Just pull it till we reach the end, which is right about there. Pull the knot out. Cut it. And then we can pull this through. Now the hard part is fishing the new one in. So before we do that, let's just see if we can wind it anymore. Yeah, we got one extra turn out of it, so that should be good. Then we'll take the new rope and maybe get it to where it needs to be. Now I should have grabbed the needle nose pliers because once I get it in there, you kind of need to pull it up and out so you can tie the knot. Carp is done. So I need to burn the end of this rope just to melt it. And that will allow it to go through the handle. Theoretically. And then we need to cut this little piece of metal free. Tie a knot. And we'll be mostly done. You know, we might need to shorten, you know, the ends a little bit. And then we can put it back on, try it out. Yeah, that should do. And we'll just take a little bit off this end. Perfect. I'd like to say it cleaned up pretty well, but it was pretty clean to begin with. You know, that said, it is cleaner. So hopefully this is going to solve our run issue. So let's start by getting the float and the needle back on. You know, I was able to actually clean up the needle with the Dremel. I thought this was a rubber tip needle, and it's not. It's actually a metal tip. So there is a rubber seat in there, which isn't necessarily a good thing. So I did put some carb spray in there. So, you know, there is a chance that I damaged that seat. I guess we'll find out in a minute because if it caused the seat to swell, then the float is not going to be level. It's going to be way off. Usually what happens is that the needle won't really go down into the seat. So instead you're left with a float that is not parallel with the body of the carb. You 
Yeah, in this case, we look pretty good. If that seat was swollen, it would probably look something like that, and it wouldn't go down any further. So I think we're okay with this one. So let's get these two halves back together. The pilot needle was about one and a third turns out. I'm actually gonna set it at one and a half. You know, for now I'm gonna leave the air box off anyway so we can fine tune this. Uh, but for now, we're not gonna be doing much fine tuning. You know, I can't run it for too long inside, but I should be able to get it roughly close, at least close enough to see that we can run without the choke on. So that is one and a half turns out. We'll get this back in. We'll just put this in, tighten it down, and then we can put the needle in. We'll lightly bottom it out and then back it out two turns. Ah. This gasket fell apart. So that is going to be an issue. Let me see if I have anything. I can substitute maybe with something else. So I do have a couple other Flowjack carburetors. This one was given to me actually by a local subscriber. And I think it has the O-ring that we need. It does, and actually the needle I was gonna say it looks cleaner, but it seems to be a different length. So we'll just take the gasket, assuming it comes off. Yep. Move it over here. And try this again. Hopefully it doesn't kind of blow apart like the last one. And I kind of doubt this was the right part either. It just doesn't look right so it might have been a homemade gasket of some sort yeah th this one feels much better so we're gonna lightly bottom out this needle which is right there then we'll back it up Half one, half two. That should do it. So let's get this back on the machine and try it out. We still have issues. I'm a little suspect of this gasket. It's very thin and potentially could be a vacuum leak. All right, let's give it a try. We are fueled up and ready to go. So hopefully 
We can turn the choke off this time without the engine stalling. Got worried there for a second when it didn't start first pull. Thankfully, it did start the second pull, and it was running really rich. So turned the choke off right away. You know, the engine was stumbling, but thankfully, it recovered. Now, it still wasn't sounding great, so I brought in this main jet needle maybe a quarter turn, and things smoothed out pretty well. I then held it in the idle position and adjusted the pilot jet. So we're now at two turns out there. You know, this main jet needle, we're going to have to adjust a little bit more once it's under load. But for now, I think we're pretty close. Uh, not to mention, once we add the air box, that's going to throw things off a little bit as well. You know, anyway, carb, I think that issue is solved. We can cross that off the list. And I didn't hear that strange noise this time either. So I think adding a little bit of oil fixed that issue as well. So now that we know this is such a good running machine, I kind of want to deal with the lack of mobility. You know, it looks like someone had modified this at some point for wheels of some sort, but that has been deleted. But I would like to add it back. I do seem to have enough parts hanging around to do that. So I put this half inch rod in right here. It goes all the way through to the other rail. And what I'm hoping to do is use these cheap Harbor Freight wheels to give us a little bit of mobility. Now, I do need to use this spacer to convert it up to 5 8 which will then allow this wheel to mount up properly. So we need to cut the spacer to size. We need to cut the rod to size. That'll take care of that issue. I also have a handle that is meant to mount on a square frame rail like that right there. So that will bolt right up, no issues. And then finally, we need a foot for the front. And I do have one. It's not perfect though. I mean, it is heavy duty enough. I guess the issue is it's a little bit short. When I mount it on the bottom of this rail, it's actually gonna be higher up and we're gonna be short by about an inch. So we are gonna have to come up with something to shim this in order for this to work. But I think you know, I don't think that's going to be an issue. So let's get the wheels on first, maybe the handle next, and then we'll figure out what to do about this. So on this side, we want it to be pretty much the same level. And on the back side, I might cut it just a little bit long. Doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, we just don't want to cut it too short. So I'm going to cut two of these to the same length.
perfect. It's exactly where I wanted it to be. So let's slide this in a bit. We don't need to cut both ends of the rod. So I'm going to need to leave about that much out. I'm just going to use a push nut to secure this in place. And we'll mark the other side where we need to cut. I was about to say this came out perfect and install these push nuts and call it done. And unfortunately, there's a bit of an oversight here. You know, wheels, they do usually get installed on the heavier side of the machine, which happens to be the generator side. You know, in this case, it's not going to work out because the exhaust is exiting right against this tire and it's going to make quick work of it. You know, it's either going to melt it or catch it on fire or most likely both. So I'm just gonna take a second, I'm gonna move the wheel over to the engine side and we'll just reverse everything else and I think we'll be okay. Unfortunately, whoever drilled these holes did not line them up quite right. So it might need a little bit of persuasion to get in there. Big difference, a couple wheels make, and the handle very easy to install. And most likely this is kind of what would have been there if the original owner had purchased the optional wheel kit. Anyway, as far as this foot goes, I'm gonna give this one a little bit of thought. I'm not crazy about my options here. I mean, it's just not the right size. So I'm gonna pause it for a second, just look around. You know, maybe I have something else that I forgot about that will work a little bit better 
than this. So to solve this issue, I'm just gonna use this piece of square tubing. It measures an inch and a quarter in each dimension, and that's exactly the size we need to make the perfect spacer to level this thing out. So we need to cut about a foot of this off. Uh, the only complication I see here is that the stator mounting bolts go in through the frame rail and actually come out on the bottom, which is gonna interfere with this installing properly. So we are gonna have to cut out some of the metal on top, which is fine. I mean, ideally I would have purchased a piece of C-channel, uh, but they didn't have one in the right dimension. So this is what we got and this is what we're gonna work with. Anyway, before getting this cut up and installed, there is another issue we need to deal with. Right now, I have the frame perfectly leveled, but if you look closely at the engine in the stator, it's actually going downhill. And it's a little bit hard to tell on this side because we have the exhaust there. But if I go over on this side, it might be a little bit more obvious. So yeah definitely going downhill. And the reason for that are these mounts right here. They are not broken, but they do seem to be collapsed. And that stator support is pretty much resting right on the bottom rail. So I would like to correct that before proceeding. So I think I'm gonna swap out this type of mount for something more like this. It goes directly under this bracket and it's not going to collapse. And that's actually going to solve another issue too because the wiring for the electric start is right here. So ideally the battery would also go right here, but there's really not much space, especially with this type of mount. So if we switch to the other type, then all this moves kind of under the bracket and gives us a lot more room to work with. I just tried lifting the stator up and couldn't do so. There is something right here that I don't think is factory. It's actually a bolt. Looks like someone ran through a custom hole on the top and on the bottom. There's actually a bolt, or I should say a nut, holding it to the frame rail. So I got to shuffle this over, get that unbolted before I can lift this up. But I'd say this was someone's attempt to kind of minimize what was going on over here. I think we're free. The nut's just spinning on the bottom, but it looks like it's spun out from the top. So I should be able to lift this up now and just support it so that it's kind of off the bottom rail here. going to be tight. We don't have a lot of clearance up above. I might have to pull that control panel. Or actually, we can just pull the bracket all together 
install the mounts, and then can we get it back? Yeah, I think that'll work. I think we're making out pretty well on this one. Sometimes when you switch from kind of that offset mount to the one that's right under it, you know, the bolt holes don't line up and you have to re-drill. In this case, everything is now loosely attached and I'm gonna leave it this way for a minute. I wanna take a look at the engine side. You know, those engine mounts also seem to have a problem. Yeah, I think that did it. We actually should get this piece of wood out of there just to know for sure, because this is going to drop down a little bit. And yeah, that looks dead on to me. So that was a pretty quick and easy fix. Now on the engine side, you know, we have a similar issue. The mounts are, you know, almost touching, like it's collapsed. And now that these are off, I can see a little bit better. It, it actually might be designed that way because there is actually rubber sandwiched in between. Like that is actually a feature and not a flaw of the mounts. You know, regardless, these mounts, they were too short. They might have been that way from the factory. Anyway, that issue's corrected now. You know, these I'm gonna leave good enough alone, but you can kind of see, you know, these mounts are all twisted. So I'm gonna loosen the top and the bottom bolts just kind of straighten out these brackets, re-secure them, and then we'll tighten the rest of it up. Yeah, I think I forgot to show you, but this is the little extra piece I pulled out that was right there. This was just kind of acting as a stop to limit the amount of sag, I guess, that this system had. You know, whether this was factory or not, I am not sure, but if it's not, so it's a pretty creative solution by someone. Anyway, let's get those fixed up. We'll tighten those up and move on to getting that foot on. You can just see how twisted these are. It might be tough to straighten this out. You know, I do have other mounts, but they're not quite compatible. Although this one might be. No, it's not. There's just a few little differences on the newer style that isn't exactly plug and play. So let's just tighten up the top one now that that alignment has been fixed. And we'll just have to muscle the bottom one straight and tighten that one up as well. Not sure how well this is gonna work out. Kinda need one person pushing and holding while the other one tightens. You know, I kinda think this is in the wrong spot like maybe the engine mount should be in that hole. Is that gonna make it worse? Yeah, actually it is. So, yeah, it's kind of weird actually. There is really no further adjustment on these uh, just based on where the holes are drilled. So, you know, I think it might be better to set it back to how it was. Get this bottom plate all the way back on the rail and just have the top plate a little crooked. It's not the end of the world, but the issue here is that this bolt hole in the engine is right over the edge of the rail. 
and the hole in the rail is more like over here. So this twist that's here, you know, I don't think there's any way to get that out given the way that this was designed. Might as well clean this up while we're here. Again, just WD-40. Take that oily mess right off. The center of this rail is right about there. So visually, this is where the foot should go. You know, functionally, that's not the best spot. The majority of the weight of this machine is right here in the stator. And if you follow this down, it's actually on the left side of this foot. So this machine is a lot more likely to roll to the left, especially when transporting it, if I put the foot right there. Now, some manufacturers, not many, do favor one side to help stabilize things. So that's what I'm gonna do. So let's get that square tubing. We'll cut it to length. Uh, we need to notch it in at least two spots to accommodate these stator bolts. And then we'll get that all bolted together. So I roughly marked out where we need to cut out on the top to accommodate the stator mounts. Now, originally I was gonna use the same tool to do that, which would work, but it's kinda make a mess of things. So I'm thinking instead of just trying the step drill bit, you know, in this case we line up pretty well right here. So we'll just make this large enough to accommodate the bolt 
that is holding the stator on. And over here, we'll probably just drill out in the middle and then just increase the size until it fits properly. Think that'll work. I think that worked out pretty well. That square tubing went in there without issue. And right now the weight of the generator is on that foot and we are nice and level. The frame is parallel with the ground. And of course, with the adjustment we made over there with the stator mount, you know, the engine and the stator are now in there level as well. And you can see, I just spent a minute cleaning this up and this thing is looking pretty good. It's gonna clean up really well. So. Before I secure this, I think I'm gonna fix this key. It's a quick fix and yeah, it's pretty bent. Perfect. All right, let's try to do this without losing the generator off the table. I've got the jack right here holding this side up. I've kind of pulled it out beyond the table so that this rail is exposed and I can access it with the drill to put the holes in there that I need to secure that leg.
And now for the fun part, we get to straighten out this control panel. Now, it's not that hard to straighten out once we get this front piece off. Unfortunately, to get it off, everything populating the control panel has to be removed. Uh, we also have a couple bolts back here, all the bolts and screws on the front, a couple more right there. And I think the heat shield also has to come off to allow that control panel to come out of there. Everything's in pretty good shape internally. There's nothing actually broken. And what I thought were cracks, they are cracks, but it's cracks in the sticker. If you look on the back side, the metal is intact, although a bit deformed. And the worst of it, of course, is over here. So let's just pound both of these sections back into shape and we should be good to put it back together. Yeah, unfortunately, that is not going to fit up here. Uh, luckily, I have a cement floor, so I'm going to just lay this down flat on the floor. Maybe put a piece of cardboard on this side to help protect this face. And we'll just beat on it from the back until things straighten out. All right, we'll give this a try. The cardboard might absorb too much of the impact, so it may not work might have to eliminate that. So, you know, I could just hit this direct to kind of flatten this out, but it is going to make it a little bit deformed doing that. So I'm going to get a block of wood. I'll actually get a bigger hammer and just whack the wood against the metal and that'll do less damage and hopefully get a better result. Yeah, it's a lot better. I actually think I went a little too far. You know, hammering on something soft isn't really the best idea for making that perfectly flat. So maybe if I put some wood underneath it, you know, that is still better than directly on the concrete and might kind of fix this up a bit.
It's a lot better. This side was bent pretty severely, and that's not the case anymore. It actually looks almost perfect. You know, we still have a bit of an issue here. It's not nearly as bad as it was. You know, I kind of wish this would fit up on the vise because we could make that almost perfect. But I think that is close enough. It came out pretty well. This side was the worst of the damage and you would almost never know what it looked like before. You know, everything straightened out pretty well. You know, even this side, I was able to get the metal nice and smooth. You know, unfortunately, we did lose a little bit of that label, but everything is secured in there well. We got a good look at everything and there's no damage inside. So this side, I would say is done. You know, at some point I do want to revisit the shim I made, throw some paint on it, and maybe paint up this exhaust. But for now, I'm going to turn my attention to the electric start. We haven't tested it, and I want to make sure it works before we mount a battery. So we've got two black wires to connect to the battery. Uh, this black wire is actually the negative. It's connected over to the block. And this one, with the bare copper exposed, to the start solenoid is the positive. So let's just throw a battery up on the bench real quick. We'll connect it with some vice grips, turn the key and see if the starter even works. We'll just get this tape off. This is something I added because when the engine runs, the generator charges the battery. So you don't want this touching anything because you could burn out the winding. And it looks like we have more bare copper on this wire too. So we do need to replace it ideally with a red cable. But for now, this will be fine for testing. All right, let's try this out. The choke is off. 
There is actually fuel in the carb, so there's a chance it could start. So we got it in the run position. Yeah, electric start works fine. So let's do another test. I have a smaller battery that'll fit in there. Don't know if it's enough to crank this engine. So let's try that battery. And see if it can turn the engine over. You can see this one's a lot smaller, but it's what you find on newer generators. So this kind of has a chance of fitting here and you know, we can't slide it all the way back because of that bolt that's right there, but we can get a majority of it on the rail. So we can probably come up with some way to affix this. Uh, but for now, let's just try cranking the engine with this. See what happens. All right, let's turn the key. Yeah, absolutely no problem. So that is good news. So for a battery tray, I am going to use this. This is something I picked up for another project that I haven't started yet, and it should hold that battery without issue. I think the big thing is just figuring out how we want to mount it. And I'm thinking I can just use that bolt we added for the foot to bolt that corner in place. And then we'll add a couple more right there in this frame rail, and that should hold it in there pretty good. Now, there's only two issues here that I can foresee. We have a pretty beefy weld right there, so when the tray goes down, it doesn't sit flat. So I'm thinking if we just add a couple washers where the bolts are to kind of elevate the tray just a bit, then we should be okay. When we tighten down, we're not gonna end up bending the tray. Uh, the other issue is the bolts themselves they're actually gonna be in the tray. So when I go to put the battery down, the battery's gonna sit kind of odd in there. So to fix that issue, I think I can just use some foam, maybe double up on it, cut around the bolts, and that should allow the battery to sit in there pretty nice. Now, before I do that, I do wanna fix these cables. These ring terminals are in pretty bad shape. We have wire exposed on the positive, so I've got some new ring terminals there we'll crimp on, and I think I'll do the one up here as well. That should not be like that, especially on the positive wire. Now, I checked my stash. I don't have any wire that's colored red in the proper gauge, so I'm going to stick with this one, but I'll throw on some red shrink tubing so that way people know, just from looking at it, how to connect it properly.
yeah, you know what? We don't even need shrink tubing for this because, I mean, this wire can touch anything. Well, except positive. But I'll put some on anyway. It's just a little bit extra insurance that the connector will stay on. That one bolt is almost enough. It's actually pretty secure. So I'm thinking now we'll just add one more bolt right there with a couple washers underneath to space it. I cut up a second one exactly the same as the first. I guess the question is, will it stick to foam? Yep, 
Yeah, perfect. Now, ideally, I'd put the battery in like this, positive on the right, negative on the left. But I don't like doing that because if this battery gets loose, it doesn't take much for it to fall against the metal and potentially short out. So as long as you have enough cable, you, know, you can reverse it, and just connect it up like that, which in this case, I think will be fine. So I want to check the voltage real quick. There's not a lot of fuel in the car, but I think there is enough to start it just for a second. It may not run too well, but hopefully it'll run long enough. So we're starting at 12.97 volts. Just turn you down here so hopefully you can see it. And I'll start the engine. Well, the good news is it's charging the battery. The bad news, the voltage is way too high. Something like this should charge at around 13 and a half up to about 14 and a half volts. And we quickly exceeded that. We were at 16 plus volts and it was climbing rapidly. So yeah, that is not good because that is gonna destroy the battery pretty quickly. So we need to find a solution for that on something like this. I actually don't think there's any adjustments. I'm gonna to have to research it. I haven't had to correct an issue like that on this type of machine. So in the interim, I'm just gonna unplug the charge wire so that way the battery won't destroy itself. And actually a lot of manufacturers don't even have a charging system when the engine's running because most of the time the engine's not running and you actually need to charge it when it's not running so that when you need to use it, it's ready to go. So worst case, we can just use a manual charger, but hopefully we can figure this out. Anyway, let's get that unplugged. And then I wanna move on to the fuel tank. That is kind of the last big question mark here. You know, we need to clean it up, test it for leaks, and hopefully we don't find any. This is kind of an odd connector. You know, I'm willing to bet there is a diode in here. You know, these systems are usually pretty simple. It's just AC coming out of the stator. There's a single diode there, so it's not a full bridge rectification. It's just a half bridge, so it's pulsing DC to that battery, charging it. So, yeah, I'm not sure how we would adjust the voltage unless we added something a little bit more advanced than this. So... See if we can get this apart without breaking it. There we go. Yeah, and that's it for now. We'll just leave it like that. So I'm going to start just by mopping up the junk that's in there. There's not a lot, but we'll get it somewhat clean. Then I'm going to put some fresh fuel in, kind of splash it around to clean things up. And then I'm going to tip it on its side and kind of test these areas, make sure nothing is seeping out.
All right, let's give this a try. I scrounged up a different cap because the one that came on the machine has this integrated fuel gauge. And that's going to cause a problem because this gauge, well, it has a vent on it. But also, if I want to put a piece of plastic to stop it from leaking, that's going to make things difficult. So this cap I scrounged up. It is the correct thread. So we'll twist this on pretty tight. And hopefully we don't leak. So let's just start by checking the sides. You know, I don't suspect we have an issue there. But I have a feeling this tank was used as a workbench at one point, given that drill hole in the tank. And I can see the bushing right here is actually leaking. So we are going to have to replace that. All right, let's see. Yeah, it looks good. Nothing leaking from this hole. You know, the cap is leaking a little, but that's fine. And this other spot right here and here, no leaks. So we have a good tank. We just need to get a new bushing in there so the fuel valve doesn't leak. So we'll start just by getting this old line off of here. You know, the fuel valve seems to work fine. So we'll keep that if we can. And there is absolutely no graceful way to get this off. The important thing is don't damage where the new bushing is going to go. You know, also this is plastic, so, you know, don't damage the tank. But I feel like you do have to use unreasonable force to get these out. And so far I haven't broken a tank. So hopefully I haven't just jinxed myself. got to be a better way. All right, I am gonna, I think I'm gonna cut off this fuel filter here. It's not looking so healthy. Uh, plus we're gonna have one in line. So if anything, this is just gonna cause a problem if we leave it on there. And yeah, it doesn't look great down there. Let me get a pick, see if I can get any of that junk out. You know what? I'm not going to try to reuse this. Although it still works, there's a lot of rust in there and remnants of the bad fuel filter. So, you know, I do have some new ones that don't think they were that expensive. It's pretty much the same part. It comes with a new bushing, a whole new valve and filter. And to get this installed, you need to put a little bit of oil on the inside of the bushing. Or a lot of oil. And 
And same thing with this piece right here. And just push it in. There we go. Before securing the tank, I'm just going to clean it real good. And I actually want to fill this hole with JB Weld. Although it's not leaking, it's got to be pretty close to going through. So I just want to shore that up a bit. That's just a bit of WD-40. It makes it a lot easier to put these lines on. We're just about there. I mean, almost everything is back together and functioning the way that it should. The only thing left really is to get that air box back on and then we can bring it outside and test. Uh, that said, we do still need to do a little bit of cleaning. And of course, there's the exhaust. It looks pretty bad. So I'm gonna try to get those rusty bolts out. Uh, we'll sand this up, throw some fresh paint on it. Well, that is an interesting choice of fastener. It's an Allen key. Bolts don't look too rusted though, so I think, I think these will come out.
Yep, there's one. Okay, and we also have a bracket kind of behind the stator, behind the exhaust, with two bolts in it. So we get those out, and we should be free. I also pulled out the spacer. I'm gonna get some paint on it to help protect it. And I'm gonna spray it black so it'll blend it in with the machine so you won't even notice it. Uh, the blower housing, you know, the color isn't terrible. Originally it would have been green. You know, if someone hadn't have sanded it, I actually probably would have just left this alone. But the fact that we have bare metal here, it is just rusting out. So we do need to put some paint on this. You know, I could keep it the same color potentially change it to gray. Uh, ideally, I'd paint it green, but I don't have any good greens I can use. I actually went to the store today trying to find a better match, and I thought I found one. You know, I test sprayed it in the store. It looked darker, but it looked like it was going to complement this green pretty well. So I brought a can home, test sprayed it here, and yeah, that is not going to work, not even close. So the store lights were playing tricks on me, I think. So John Deere green is out, blue, red, definitely out. You know, this gray isn't too bad. So I might use that. You know, I could paint it white or black. Kind of undecided, leaning towards black. So either way, we need to get this uninstalled, cleaned up, and make a decision and get some paint on it. That looks nice and clean in there. Almost zero corrosion on the aluminum, uh, which is impressive.
this thing cleaned up really well. You know, for a machine that was made in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, you don't see many that look like this anymore. You know, granted, this one needed some help, but I'd say it's looking better than it has, I would say, since new. Maybe ever. Anyway, it is late now, so in the morning, let's roll this thing outside. We'll get it started up, see if she can still pull 5,000 watts. I was just getting things ready to test and realized I can't use the load bank on this generator. You know, the 5,000 watt generators is kind of a toss up whether you're going to get a 20 amp or 30 amp output. And right now, my load bank has a 50 amp plug and I only have a 30 amp adapter. So I don't have anything I can use currently to adapt this into the load bank. So we're just going to use the space heaters for now. Now, you know, I guess the disappointing thing is that even if I had the adapter, I mean, the output is rated at 20.8 continuous amps and 20 amps is just a little shy of that. So you're never really going to get the 5,000 Watts out. Although technically these circuit breakers likely can handle a little bit more before they pop. So I guess with that in mind, we are limited to the 120 outputs and that's where it gets a little more disappointing because we should have full access to the 42 amps out at 120 volts. And instead we have a circuit breaker for 35 amps. So we're gonna be limited to 4,200 watts before this thing pops. So, you know, that said, I'm gonna get it up as high as I can. That might trip because I'm probably gonna go over. And if it does, that's fine. We'll take a little bit of load off, reset things and keep going. All right, let's give this thing a try. I've got the external tank connected, feeding fuel to the carburetor. Uh, the plan is just to get the engine started. We'll let it warm up. And while it's warming up, we'll double check the outputs, make sure we're good. And assuming we are, we'll start bringing on the load. Now, technically this is 6,000 watts of load. And since this is a 240 volt and a 120 volt generator, when we bring the load on just using the 120s, we actually need to keep the load balanced. We only have 250 watts on each leg. So the space heaters on the left are on the leg one and the space heaters on the right are on the leg two. So I'm going to turn the end space heaters on first. That'll be a balanced load of 3000 watts total. And assuming things are running well, we'll turn the middle ones on low. Now those are gonna pull about six or 700 watts each. So that technically will bring us just a little bit over the limit and we might trip that circuit breaker. So yeah, let's get it started and see how we make out. All right, let's give this a try. We'll turn the fuel on, choke on, and the electric start is on the opposite side.
Yeah, overall, this old machine did a very good job. It started without issue. The engine continued to sound good, uh, but the engine speed, it was slow. You know, that is something we didn't check before. It was at 57 hertz, no load, and ideally that would be closer to 61 and a half hertz. So we did increase the governor tension by turning this knob clockwise and got the engine to about 61 hertz. And at that point, the voltage actually came up as well to 133 volts, which is high. But for something like this, it's not unusual. There is no automatic voltage regulator. So what you typically see is high voltage without a load. And under a full load, the voltage comes down by about 20 volts. And that's exactly what we saw because under a full load, we were now at 113 volts. Uh, the engine was holding at 57 hertz. So everything was looking good. And then I took the load off and saw that the engine was actually now running too fast. Without a load, it was at 64 hertz. So I backed that spring tension off a bit, down to 62 hertz. We tried a full load again just to make sure things could hold at 57 hertz, and it did without issue. And then when I took that load off, again, the engine speed was a little bit high at 63 hertz. So I gave it a minute for the engine to cool down, and I saw that engine speed dropping. It actually quickly came back down to 62 hertz. So that you know, it's pretty typical. I don't think we have any issues there. Now, as far as the jetting goes, I didn't have to touch that. You know, I think we were right on the money and the power quality, well, yeah, I wouldn't say it's clean. You know, we started at 10% no load. The highest I saw was about 18% under a heavy load. So not great, but actually better than most sold today. So. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't run sensitive electronics on it, but considering the options out there today, you know, aside from inverters, this one really isn't that bad. Plus, you know, cleaned up really well. You know, I kind of like this machine. Anyway, I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.